Okay, so uh, we'll get started. Uh, thank everybody for coming this afternoon. Uh, uh, I would like to introduce myself, Gabriel Zapodano. I am a Cisco Technology Solutions Architect. Uh, I am with the Global Sales Scaling team. I am focused on programmability, on uh, network programmability. Before being in this role, I have been a network engineer for the past 20 years. I worked with a lot of large customers in the Pacific Northwest in the United States. I did uh, work with a lot of manufacturers, but also with a lot of healthcare, hospitals, government entities, with the airport uh, in Portland, uh, with a lot of different verticals. Um, my experience is as a network engineer, so I'm not a developer, but i like to ask you, what's your background? Are you guys developer? Uh, network engineers, what is your background? Any developers? Okay, network engineers? Perfect. So, we are not trying to make or change what we do. Our skills as far as network engineering are very valuable, but we have to learn some uh, new skills which are regarding programmability, regarding APIs, how we can use these new capabilities to make our life easier. Uh, our session today is going to be focused on a manufacturing vertical, focused on manufacturers, but the same concept, the same technologies, the same concept that I'm going to show you as a use case can be applied anywhere in any industry. All of us, in, regardless in which vertical we work, we have critical assets that are both wireless or wired. And the same troubleshooting methods that I'm going to share with you can be applied for wired uh, assets. Maybe there is a very important device in a healthcare uh, for a customer or in a, uh, anywhere, in a utility, in a substation. In any of these environments, we have critical assets and a lot of times, a lot of what we do as network engineers, we do troubleshooting. We can speed up the process of troubleshooting by using APIs to make our life easier, to collect data, to do all the things that are very repetitive. We'll, we can use APIs to collect the data being provided to us, and in that way we can uh, finish troubleshooting, get back uh, to operations much, much quicker. Our session was supposed to have two presenters. Uh, my friend Stan Nilchev was not able to make it to Berlin. Uh, he is a, a very accomplished engineer. He has worked in a lot of different, uh, for a lot of different customers. He has a very rich background. Uh, he worked for a manufacturer for many years, and we presented together in the past uh, this session to uh, regarding a manufacturing vertical uh, architecture. Well, we are going to go over an overview of wireless manufacturing, but again, as I said, this is not only for manufacturing. Healthcare, we have a lot of assets that are wireless connected. Uh, in any industry, wireless is the default connectivity. My laptop doesn't have an Ethernet connection anymore. So anywhere we look, especially with the Internet of Things taking over our uh, basically uh, market, we are going to see more and more devices that are wireless connected. That's why wireless is becoming more and more critical for everything we do from infrastructure perspective. So wireless in manufacturing, uh, typically, Wireless has to be pervasive. We need wireless uh, pretty much throughout the entire infrastructure. That includes the office space, includes the plant floor, includes the yards, uh, includes uh, even sometimes in transportation. We have wireless in airplanes, in buses, everywhere. And because of this, uh, usually there is a large variety of devices that we need to connect to wireless. Uh, in our case, we are going to show troubleshooting for AGVs or AGCs. Do you know what an AGV or AGC is? Okay, so uh, in this case, we are going to help troubleshooting these assets because they are very critical. But this could be any device. It doesn't really have to be. Could be a device that is point of sale in a retail. And of course, without wireless connectivity, they're not going to process transactions. So any device, again, wireless or wired, we can help through, through some APIs, through programmability to troubleshoot quicker. Uh, typically, in, uh, in the manufacturing environment, we have AGVs, we have uh, tools, we have tags, uh, we have uh, diagnostic tools that are very important for uh, the manufacturing plant floor. And uh, obviously, 
uh, as I said, any time that we have lack of connectivity, there is going to be a very cost event. It's very costly anywhere between could be hundreds of thousands of dollars per hour to even more from manufacturing perspective. Uh, please, uh, let's keep this session interactive. If you have any questions, please ask. Uh, this is a, a session where I hope all of us learn something. I want to learn from you what we need to change, and also I hope you guys uh, will be able to ask questions so we can, uh, I can give you more details. Uh, typical infrastructure from wireless perspective, uh, this is a standard infrastructure. We have high availability controllers. Uh, we have industrial switches or catalyst switches if it's office space or hospitals. Uh, we have a variety of Wi-Fi enabled devices, RFID tags, and very common from Cisco's perspective, you are going to have prime infrastructure to manage everything and Cisco Mobility Experience or Mobility Services Engine. Uh, this has been a very proven architecture. It, it's very highly available. We have done a lot of improvements to improve high availability. Uh, and uh, I think it's, uh, it's extremely popular through the customer environments. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the AGVs. So for those that don't know, the AGVs are these carts. They are huge carts that are going to move around the manufacturing plant and will be driving pre much manufacturing line. These cards have uh, PLCs, programmable language controllers, that are connected through a wireless client or a device to the wireless network. It is very important for these devices to be connected uh, to the wireless network. If they drop that connectivity, then the communication to the HMI, the human machine interface, will be uh, basically there's a disconnection, and then what does it happen? So it will stop because obviously safety, the cards can move. And also these cards, as they move, actually they help manufacturing, like in this case is a motorcycle, Harley-Davidson plant, but it will turn the motorcycle up and down. And the same is even with trucks. I worked for many, many years with Daimler Trucks North America or Detroit Diesel, a manufacturer of actually engines and transmissions. As workers work on these engines, the cart is going to move around the engine so they can do the work better, safer. So it's very, very important for all of this to be con constantly connected to wireless. And from my experience working with all of these manufacturers, we've done everything we could. So, hey, we need to upgrade the wireless infrastructure, do an adverse survey, we need to increase density, we need to move data to 11 uh, uh, A and introduce clear, clean air. We've done over the years a lot of improvements. However, we still have problems uh, from wireless perspective because nothing is perfect and a lot of these problems are not wireless related, could be client related. So uh, troubleshooting for any wireless connectivity doesn't have to be manufacturing. Uh, you guys tell me if this sounds familiar, all of these steps. Is this what you would normally do and probably do have even more steps? So we need to find out is it a problem with the HMI or PLC? Is it a problem with an access point or the client or the switch? Is a layer two, is a layer three problem? We need to look at logs. We need to find what is the client that has been disconnected. How many times does it happen that actually the business calls us and tells us, hey, something is not working? Do we ever know before the business tells us? We get so many alarms that at times we just can deal with this and a lot of times, like in manufacturing environments, those lines move so slow that actually the plant management will call IT to complain something is down. And then we don't know what is down. It takes us some time because there is a lot of steps we need to do. What if I tell you that we can simplify all of these steps and get you all the information or most of the information to get you started so when it does happen, you already know that it happened because you have been alerted and you already have the information to help you make a diagnosis. Is it a client or is the network and kind of have an idea what's going on from network perspective? Would it be interesting? Okay. So the challenges are uh, 
it is taking time because we have a lot of tools. We need to go to Prime, we need to go to the controller eventually, we need to collect syslogs from a different resource because the switches, we need to collect information about wireless from CMX, what is disconnected from the mobility uh, engine. Uh, we have you guys, all of us have other things to do. It's not that we are watching those monitoring systems constantly. So for us, we need to be very comfortable with a lot of different tools and understand RF spectrum, understand layer two, understand layer three, understand a lot to be able to troubleshoot this. And a lot of times, uh, it takes time to log in in all of these different systems and collect data and then start to analyze. And uh, there is another problem, collaboration tools. If you need to engage with an engineer that is in a different location, there is no integration between these tools. You need to start a WebEx, invite them, takes time. And also there is another part that is very interesting that we cannot do today, analytics. Do we know where we have chronic problems in our environment? We don't have any history, historical data. We don't have any data to go back to look past half a year or a year. In this location, we have constantly problems. We reported so many issues. Let's do a site survey because maybe between the last site survey and now, things change and we need to address few things. Unless if you have a different process within the enterprise network to collect this data and really maintain, there isn't any any way to do it. We can automate that part of the process where now every time we have a disconnected device, we keep track and we can update the database and we can analyze it and see we have a problem here and we better address because now if we do it, 90% of these disconnects will be avoided. Questions? Yes. Yeah, so, so obviously we are going to depend. So the question is about the protocols that are being used between the controllers and Prime and CMX. So there is so much we can do with some of these protocols. For example, we'll talk in a moment about timeouts. When a client gets disconnected, there is a five minutes timeout, which is the default, before the controller is going to report that client, I didn't hear anything from that client, so it must be disconnected. We can play with that timeout. We can configure for those very, very critical assets. We need to test because in a very large environment, that may not be beneficial. There is so much we can do with some of these tools like SNMP or Syslog or Alerts, but at least we, outside of those, we can optimize the entire process, which is part of the human effort of doing the troubleshooting. And in the future, with the adventure, with the new improvements from REST directly to devices, switches, controllers, we will be able to address those limitations from SNMP perspective. So uh, detect, diagnose, and alert is uh, basically an API-based tool to help troubleshooting. It's not only for wireless devices. It could be for any problem that we have from network perspective. We have sometimes issues with clients that are wired, that are very critical. So with this tool, it's a concept. It's not something you can buy. It doesn't cost you anything. Actually, you get the code the entire code, you obviously don't run it in production, you can start to use it and learn and see how you can improve your life. But with this tool, we can do all of these steps. We are going to get notifications from Cisco Mobility Services Engine and act on those notifications. So if I'm creating a notification, I have 150 AGVs or critical assets, and I'm going to lose one, I'm going to create a notification and be notified when I lost that asset. Now I will be able to know before plan management calls me that I have a problem that I need to address. I'm going to validate access points. I know where the device was connected to which access point. Is that access point still up? Can I see if there are other clients being serviced by that access point? Do I have a coverage hole? I'm going to check the switch. I know which access, which switch, access switch is connected to that access point because from the controller perspective, from APKM, we have this information. I'm going to be able to alert IT and operations engineers we have a problem, let's work on this. 
I can enable integration of collaboration tools, Spark, because it's easy for me, but could be WebEx, could be any other tool to create an event where maybe the automation engineer is not in the same plan to if IT, or maybe the IT engineer is not in the plan to if the operations engineer. In this way, any engineer can help with the troubleshooting effort, could be like in my case, my manufacturers I work with, they have operations engineers in each plan, but IT is centralized. They could be hundreds of kilometers or thousands of kilometers away and work on this problem real time because they know of the problem. And I will present all of this data to the engineers so they can start analyzing instead of them wasting time to collect data. Also, there are other possibilities. I can help pushing configurations to try to address some issues. For example, one of my customers, and when I was working with them, I had no idea how to fix it. Uh, they were complaining that they were losing connectivity, communication between PLCs and HMIs or between manufacturing cells and the HMIs, even if those would be wired connected at times. And they detected that they had problems with uplinks from the access switches. One of the uplinks was taking errors. And sometimes they would lose connectivity and they didn't know it wasn't very easy for them because it was just packet loss. We can look into this kind of information, see how much packet loss I have on an, on an uplink, and my application could go and shut down that uplink. It's highly uh, available. I have redundancy. Shut down that uplink, alert IT. Manufacturing continues. Still, IT has a chance to restore the connectivity on the backup link. So, uh, how many are you, of you are familiar with REST? So, really quickly for those that are not familiar, uh, REST is, has been around for a long time. Do you know it has been actually the first time that REST was kind of as a concept was in 94, 95. And it was finally finalized as an architecture in 2000 in a PhD thesis. And REST it has been designed in mind to help scale the internet. We needed better ways for application systems to communicate on the internet. In a very simple way, it's a client to server communication. My client could be an application, could be a software, or me will ask the server for some information and I will get that information. APIs uh, have been around even longer than REST. That's how applications uh, are able to talk to each other. And RESTful APIs use basically HTTP requests, will use the methods that have been, recommend, uh, have been included in REST from architecture perspective, and there are primarily four methods. Uh, I need to create a record, I need to be able to delete a record, I need to be able to read that record, and I need to be able to update that record. So through those four methods, which are very simple, it's pretty simple to be able to configure something, delete a configuration, update some information, or read state from the applications that talk REST. So in our case, let's say an application or could be a REST client. Are you familiar with Postman? So as a REST client, uh, it is like an, basically it's an application that will create that REST request and I will get a response. In a very fundamental uh, way, REST has been created with simplicity in mind. The server needs to receive from the client through that request all the information is required to be able to respond. If something is not completed, let's say I'm asking the server to do something, the server is not going to reply saying I need more information. The server is going to decline that request. It's going to say, I don't know what you want. It's going to give me an error code to help me troubleshoot. But is, uh, the server will finish that transaction. There's no cache on the server side. A request, I'm responding. The client could maintain that information and continue maybe to change something if the request was not done right or use that information for the next uh, request. So five components that are very important in any API request. I need to send a URL, which is composed from two parts. One is the server. So I need to go to a server. Let's say if I want to go to Spark, it's ciscospark.com. 
and then I need to define what is the resource I want. And maybe it's rooms, maybe it's messages, maybe it's uh, teams, could be anything. But I need to go to a resource that allows me to do uh, one of the transactions that we need, which is post, get, put, or delete, which means I can update a record, create a record, read or delete the record. Do you think authentication is important for APIs? It is very important. Unfortunately, there are a few different methods to off somebody, and there is no standard, like with REST, there isn't really a standard. There's no standard. Most common method would be HTTP basic. So a lot of times you are going to see this, which is pretty straightforward. Python actually has a module to allow you to create that thing uh, off string. But there are other methods. We need a header because when I'm communicating with the server, I need to tell the server I'm going to send you some data and I want data from you. And those, the data typically is one of two formats. It's going to be XML or JSON. JSON is much easier for us to read. So also, by default, a lot of applications today will default to JSON. So if I don't say content type, which is I'm going to send you JSON, then the server it will use the default and assume it's XML or JSON. And in request body, I'm going to send what I want the server to do. So in a simple way, let's say if I go to, uh, let's use Spark because it's easy. Uh, are you familiar with Spark, what Cisco Spark is? So in Spark, if I want to create a room, I need to tell the server what room I want to create. That information is going to be sent in the body in a JSON format so the server knows what I'm asking. So as I said earlier, the server is not going to maintain state. It's not going to reply to me if something is not correct saying I need more information. It's going to send me, if everything is correct, 200 or 201. Those are the most common ones. And that's great. We are happy. Everything was great. If something is not perfect, something is not okay, then the server is going to tell us, well, it's unauthorized, which means maybe I didn't put the proper user ID password, username password. It's going to tell me maybe 404 not found, which a lot of times means I'm trying to access a resource that doesn't exist on the server. So if that information we can troubleshoot, and since we have only five things that we need to send in a request, troubleshooting is not hard. It really, with this basically uh, codes, we can narrow down to one or two things that we need to look. Doesn't take long time. The header, same information, the server is going to tell us, I'm going to send you JSON or XML because the server will respond in the way we ask, but if not, it's going to send data in the format that is default for that server. And really the part that is very important for us, what we really want a lot of times is the body. That's where I get the information I'm looking. So if I'm going to CMX, Cisco Mobility Services Engine, Mobility Experience, and I need to find out a list of clients, then I want that list of clients is going to come in this payload in a JSON formatted data. Are we okay, are we okay so far? It's good? It's too hard, too easy, too fast? <laughs> so my application, in a very fundamental way, uh, we need a user interface. So we need to be able to communicate with the user. It could be anything. In my case, you'll see what it is. It's Spark. We need to be able to, because I'm tracking location information, I need to be able to locate devices and alert when I'm losing a device. I need to be able to have a view of the entire topology of the network, so I need a network controller. And I need to be able maybe to manage devices, and for that uh, I need a network management tool. In my case, and again, these user interfaces could be anything, could be a web client, a web app, could be a mobile app, could be anything. In my case, it's Spark and Tropo because it was easy for me. And those are typical functionality that you are going to get through this. Cisco Mobility Experience has uh, tracking capabilities of all the wireless clients, and I know where they are connected, where they are on the map. I keep track of, I get alerts when I see them disconnected. So for me, obviously, it was very easy to use this uh, to detect floor plans, where clients are, 
all the information that is required. Mentor controller, you are familiar with APKM? So APKM has a full view of all the clients, both wired and wireless, and network devices. It has a inventory of all of these devices and has also logical and physical uh, uh, view of all the connectivity between devices. And to communicate with devices, to configure devices, I need prime infrastructure and potentially RESTConf because RESTConf is a new standard where I could configure devices directly. Uh, I can talk RESTConf to a router today, some routers, and I don't need to configure the routers for prime infrastructure. So the first step in uh, the DDA, detect, di uh, detect, diagnose, and alert, is I need to detect when I have a problem. This detection, if we don't uh, talk about wireless clients, we talk about wired, could be a switchboard going down where we know we have a good device that is critical. In my case, I'm going to use C CMX, and I'm going to define a notification that sends me an alert uh, when I'm losing a device. Also, with CMX, I can, by querying CMX, I can find out where those devices, the devices are constantly connected to the network, where they move. The last time I've seen the device, I have the information about the MAC addresses of each device, and I have the information about where, uh, obviously, the basically uh, how devices are connected to access points. Once I receive a notification that a device has been disconnected, I have a database of all of these devices, and I'm going to check to see, based on the MAC address and the IP address, which card number has been disconnected. So for me, it's very simple to do this. Instead of IT engineer or OT to look through their database or Excel and see what happened, I can provide this information because it's much, much easier for me from application perspective to do this. So here is a simple API request for uh, CMX. Um, I'm going to define a function because every time I'm using an API, I want to have a different function. And uh, that's something that I define that makes sense for me. I'm going to document my function so when you guys get the code and read, you know what I'm doing in that function. I'm going to have the URL between the CMX URL and the resource that I'm going to access, which is the count of all the clients. The header, the response, and this is really the request. So the request module is something that is built in Python that helps me send this API request. I don't need to create the requests from scratch. I have the URL, the headers, the authentication, and verify false, it's something that you should never do in production. It's going to bypass the SSL certificate validity that is common for labs environment like mine, but never do it in production. So really, this is all we need to create this API request. The response will be assigned to a response variable, could be your variable, anything you want. And that's how I'm going to parse JSON to receive what it's important for me, which is the cl all the clients that are available on that CMX. And this is what the JSON format looks. So I'm going to look for the count of all of these clients. So if a very simple API request, I'm going to get an information. How many clients do I have connected to my environment? So now I detected that I have a problem. I need to start really the hard work, which is to diagnose the problem. So as I said, there are multiple steps that we can do. With CMX, I can find out, I will know where this client was last time connected to the infrastructure. I know on what floor map. My script is simple, you'll see. It will give a coordinate X and Y. But I can calculate from that map, it's in square D5, where I can download the image from CMX and show exactly where that AGV was last time connected to the wireless infrastructure. Here in the left side is EPIC-EM with the inventory of all the devices. EPIC-EM is going to provide me more information. Are the access, P, uh, access points up? To which switchboard they are connected? Is the switchboard up? 
was the uplink of that switch port, is the, uh, of that switch, is the switch uh, reachable. So I can collect a lot of information and I can continue when I'm going to enhance this script, look for logs from prime infrastructure, add more information about statistics on ports, see if I, receive, I have packet loss or anything else. But this is a good start because I collected a lot of information from different systems and will provide all of that information to you. So these are a few other things that could be available. Are you familiar with the path trace in EPKM? So I can start the path trace from the HMI to the client, to the PLC. Where do I see the packet loss? Where the path is actually interrupted? I can add, as I said, logs from prime infrastructure. Uh, there is a lot of opportunities and this can be changed in any way you want that fits your environment. All of that information is available somewhere. So the request uh, for EPKM, very similar. The functions, the request will be right here. And uh, then I'm looking for some information back. This is the response for APKM. I can see here that I have information about the switch that maybe is the last switch that is connected to that access point and I can get information if the switch is reachable or not. So now I collected all of this information. So until now I did a lot of work but I have not done anything to inform IT about the problem. By the way, all of these steps take probably 10 seconds. So now, once I have all of this information and I know that I have a problem, I'm going to alert IT and operations engineers by creating a Spark Room. And this is what I'm going to post in Spark Room. Everything that I collected will be ready. The IT and the operations engineers, the automation engineers, plant management will receive a notification that there is a significant event. MDE line outage, medium duty engine is really what happens to, with some manufacturers. So we have a line outage and we'll tell if the access point is reachable, was the last access point, will tell me which card was disconnected, will tell me the switch, the last access switch, if it's reachable, the management IP address, pretty much everything that I collected would be available for me to actually uh, act, uh, act and know, okay, the switch is fine, access point is fine, it must be a client, let's take that card out, we know where it is, it's in the square C5, let's take it offline and we can continue manufacturing. Uh, we'll troubleshoot just the client. To add even more to this, I can send a voice call through Tropo. Are you familiar with Tropo? So it's a cloud-managed voice and messaging SMS system. So I can make a voice call to alert or send text messages to the critical engineers. You have a problem, you need to go to this location and address this problem. So in a matter of, as soon as I detected in 10, 15 seconds, I have posted a lot of information that may take 20, 30 minutes or longer for IT to actually collect and alert maybe the closest engineer to that outage, hey, you have to go there to help with this problem. Yes. Okay, so, so we have a question about this app, DDA. So this is a concept. This app runs on my laptop, could run on a server anywhere. When you go in production with this kind of concepts, you will have to work with developers and really work together with them to create an application that meets your corporate standards, is highly available, has all the checks and balances, uh, maybe distributed across two different servers, and could be running on anything. It, I could write this app on a container and then move it in production extremely easy because it would be very, very easy to move. But for IT, really to write an app like this for a proof of concept to show your developers and your plant management what you can do for them, takes you maybe a half a day or a day. And after that, it, there is a little bit more work. But the cost of developing this app versus the savings of what you can achieve, it's, it's far less. So this is a Spark request, uh, similar. How many things do we need in an API request? How many? Five, right? It's pretty simple. We need a header, the resource. We need basically the method. 
So post means I'm going to create something. Could be put, delete, uh, and then I'm going to basically get something back that I need to parse with JSON. And this is the response. So response to 100 means success. And I created a room. When I had the problem, I now I detected, I have all the information, I created a room, and I'm going to start to populate that room with this information. The room ID is important, and I'm going to spend a minute on this. With all the APIs and all of these platforms, they are not going to use room names or host names to configure, because that room name could be I'm creating a room with the name MDE line outage, and you can create a room in the same with the same no, uh, name. So Spark or Prime or APKM or CMX use devices IDs or room IDs or person IDs to know uh, the difference between different instances. So a lot of times when you are going to use APIs, you need to find the ID of a device to read something from the device or write something, change a configuration. Tropo, it's probably the easiest API that you're going to use. It takes you five minutes from the moment that you are creating a login and you create an application and you actually have an application that is running using APIs. And with Tropo, basically you, you need to just tell the server what you want. It, it does everything for you. Hey, you, as a server, I need you to call this number and read this message to them, text to speech. And that application has a unique identifier. We talked about IDs, and that unique identifier is this token. So once you created that application, it tells you, if you send this request, an HTTP yes request with this token appended, it's going to run that application for you. And now you are going to make a phone call and read the text-to-speech message to somebody to tell him that you have a problem. To test Tropo, you don't need to, I think testing is free of charge, doesn't cost you anything. So if you want to play a little bit, definitely uh, it's very, very easy. There's a request, again, very simple. Uh, what you've seen so far, all of these API requests are fundamentally kind of the same. There might be differences between them, and those differences are found in the API documentation. Very important to locate the documentation to be successful to make API requests. But all of them have the same components. You need to send some information. You are going to receive some information. You need to parse through JSON. Use that information for the next API request. Any questions? So a few other things that we want to do. We want to add another, other validations, how many other clients are connected to that access point, collect syslog from Prime. Uh, we want maybe I need to start a spend session for wired clients to see what's wrong and maybe collect that information and upload that information to the Spark room. I can uh, basically locate the closest IT engineer that is in the plant to where the outage is or in a hospital and send him to that location. So in that way, I don't need to send somebody that may be a kilometer away from the outage. I can send the guy that may be only 100 meters away from the outage. This list can, can be changed in anything that fits your environment. It's not, uh, uh, this information is available for you in many, many different ways. So what we learned, what I learned when I worked on this code, uh, start with something that is simple. And start with something that you cannot maybe do today. Because in that way, you really start to think, can I change the way I do work? Because uh, there are a lot of opportunities for us to learn some simple APIs. Let's say a very simple API request could be a user on the internet tries to connect to the wire network, and he can't connect. Maybe it's very simple to ask, OK, can I find out from APKM on which VLAN this user might be connected? Maybe the VLAN configured on that port is VLAN 600, when maybe I should have VLAN 400 for clients, 600 is for printers. With a simple API request, now you troubleshoot a problem, and you know that, well, the switchboard is configured wrong. And maybe you can even fix it if you choose so. You can have an API to send the proper configuration to that switchboard. Uh, there are a lot of help. There is a lot of content here. DevNet, right here on this floor, there are a lot of classes on 
Python, on APIs, on REST APIs, on JSON, to get you started. There is a lot of uh, there are a lot of classes to teach you about each of these different technologies, what are the APIs and how we can use them. There are communities on DevNet or other communities. I manage a community for partners, for Cisco partners, for, part, uh, for the infrastructure programmability. And uh, there is a lot of code on GitHub that you can download or this code or some other sessions I had uh, uh, here that have code and you can download and start to play with that code. And uh, it might be frustrating at times, but it will be also fun because when you are actually starting to get some of these results, it's going to be really cool to see that you can do things that you never thought you could and uh, much, much faster. You will save time once you learn this. So, uh, this concept of troubleshooting can be applied to anywhere where maybe it's a highly critical asset that you need to maintain connectivity, could be a chronic problem, something that keeps repeating, you can keep track, you can update the database with this information and you can see a trend that something is always going on, or with some users, maybe from wireless perspective, users have problems because maybe it's a client issue. Maybe the same client keeps reporting every two days, I can connect to the wireless network. This is another way for you to document information like that and really help. Maybe I need to do a driver upgrade on that client and help with this problem. And really, it is possible to integrate these tools with a lot of other things. Maybe you want to start let's say, a video session with somebody else because something's happening there. Uh, you can integrate with uh, a WebEx tool where now maybe the problem is critical for, let's say, healthcare or manufacturing and you want a partner that is outside of your organization to be engaged in this troubleshooting. Those sessions, those WebEx tools or Spark rooms can create, be created with people that are outside of your organization. So the entire code for the use case that I presented can be downloaded here. I hope, uh, well, all of you should have access. I have included also the HTML document that I created with PyDoc to help you actually read the, what that code, what each function does. To make you, uh, it's my way of remembering myself what I'm doing, but also be able to share with the others and make it easy for you to consume this code. This code is not for your production environment. I'm not responsible if you use it in production. <laughs> so please use it as a teaching. It has been developed for teaching and show to your developers what you can do because there is so much more that can be done. This is just a, a basic introduction to how you could use APIs to troubleshoot different events or chronic events or critical in your infrastructure. And I have a demo um, it is pre-recorded because I can't get access here to everything that I would need to do a live demo. Um, and uh, I hope uh, it will show you uh, what's going on. So uh, let me pause it for a second. So let me show you. Here on the right is my integrated development environment, PyCharm. Do you know what PyCharm is? So that's what I use because it, it is easy for me. If I write Python, uh, you want an editor to help you write this code better. So PyCharm is here. This is my Spark desktop client, and this is a web client for, let's say, an for a developer, for IT or operation engineers. This is my Spark client that in this moment is really running basically in the same identity with my code. Uh, the, here I have two AGVs, and yes, I do not have AGVs in my garage. That would be nice, but I can't afford that. Uh, I wouldn't be able to have them running. But I have two clients, wireless clients. Actually, my sons helped me. They were moving around because I want to be sure that I have actually the coordinates there. And as soon as I'm going to detect one of these clients disconnected, you'll see that on the Spark, events start to happen. And that's my Spark room. That's where the script starts posting in preparation for sending alerts to the IT or operation engineers. So uh, hopefully this one is running. OK. So, uh, okay, so now it's moving. 
So um, I use PAR because it's easy, but you could use any other messaging systems you have in your environment, in your uh, enterprise. So uh, this is where it starts actually populating. It will detect the disconnected client. It sends me the, basically the... OK. So as you can see here, I already identified the MAC address, the IP address of the client. The, I created the room for my script, and then I'm going to start to populate all the information that I talked to you about and uh, start to send notifications. You are going to see here the desktop client for the IT engineer being notified and you are going to see here the voice call coming from Tropo to tell me I have a problem. It really takes about 10 seconds from the moment I detect a client to the moment that I make that phone call to let them know I have a problem. Questions? Difficult, interesting, different, useful. Oh, so absolutely. So I can I can integrate with ticketing systems. I can uh, integrate with a mobile with a manufacturing execution system. I can uh, integrate with an external vendor. Hey, I need to come to help because maybe the service for something is outsourced. All of this can be possible because most of the ticketing systems do have uh, APIs available. I can send that ticket and dispatch somebody and log in the ticket that I already dispatched an engineer. I notified him. This is all the information I provided. Absolutely. There are a lot of other sessions here. Please uh, fill the surveys. Uh, it is very important for us, for me, to know how we can change, um, uh, how we can improve the sessions. Thank you for coming this afternoon. Thank you.